People of YouTube, it is I, the Duke of the Dank, the Mayor of Meme Town, everyone's favorite YouTuber, Emperor Lemon. And today, in an unprecedented, unscripted commentary, we are going to discuss the fallout of the Leafy Is Here YouTube Geographic. So first and foremost, let me just say that I have been completely blown away by the support for this video. This video must have really titillated Montezan's fancy because in less than two weeks it got over a million views. Now I've had a few videos get to a million views in the past, but this is the fastest by far it's ever happened. And all the comments, all the messages I got from this video have been overwhelmingly positive. People really, really seem to like how I put this video together. I mean really, in the last seven days I've gained over 50,000 subscribers and I've never really ever had anything like this happen before in eight years of making videos. So before I get into anything here, I have to first welcome all 50,000 of the new subscribers to the channel. Please feel free to make yourself at home, pour yourself a glass of Downward Spiral. If you subscribe to me for my editing capabilities, I regret to inform you that this video will not have any of those, just because I don't want to spend another two months working on a 40 plus minute video. In honor of Leafy, this video will feature random gameplay in the background as I commentate over it with unrelated commentary. So now, without further ado, let's get into the discussion. So first of all, I kind of just want to address the background of this video. I want to answer why I made this video. Why Emp? Why is this video 51 minutes? Me YouTuber. Me no have attention span to watch 51 minute video. Why video must be 51 minute? Well, to tell you the truth, the video was originally going to be a lot shorter. I actually started writing the script for this video way back in November, after the very first episode of YouTube Geographic. However, any fans of the channel at that time will know that that was when I started my little mini crusade against YouTube, and I sort of put the script on the back burner. But originally, this video was probably going to be like every other generic What Happened to Leafy Is Here, and uh... In hindsight, I'm glad it didn't turn out that way. My original inspiration to make the Leafy video came from just browsing on YouTube one day, and I looked at all the big commentary channels. I looked at H3H3, iDubs, Keemstar. I kind of just looked at all their stats and their subscribers just to see how much they had grown in the past year. And then I kind of remembered in the back of my head that Leafy was originally right there in the running with these guys, and he seemingly completely disappeared off the face of the earth. Now keep in mind, this was during a time before Leafy had actually stopped making videos, but I never actually heard a peep from him in the past year or so, and I was just kind of wondering what happened. I originally wanted to just explore the topic of Leafy's downfall and how he managed to sort of hit rock bottom in terms of growth. Yeah, but then after I put the script on the back burner, a lot of interesting things started happening. First of all, the Tower Dog leaks came out, which provided a whole new insight into why Leafy sort of just disappeared from my recommended feed. And that leak was, of course, about YouTube's covert censorship of certain commentary channels. And after that, I began to look at the stats. I began to look at the analytics of Leafy's channel a lot more closely. And that was when I started to notice a lot of really irregular patterns that could not be explained under normal circumstances. And considering the Tower Dog allegations, it began to make a lot more sense to me that YouTube was tampering with Leafy's numbers and suppressing him from being viewed by most of his audience. And about the same time, I made a lot of videos. I made a series of videos harshly criticizing YouTube and their decision making and their management and something very interesting happened uh, the following January, February, and March. Looking at my own analytics, I could tell that something was way off. I've been around long enough on this website where 
I kind of have an expectation of how certain videos will perform. And these videos I uploaded during this stretch, and you can go back and watch them. There's a chance that any of you who've been subscribed over the duration might not have even seen some of them because I got tons of reports from fans saying that my videos weren't showing up in their recommended and my videos weren't showing up in their subscriptions and everything was getting instantly demonetized even if it did not contain one shred of questionable content they would still get instantly demonetized as I uploaded them. I remember making a Logan Paul rant about a week after the whole thing happened and that video started off getting a ton of views and then after about a day it got age restricted and the official reason I got told for that was that they're they're age restricting anything that depicts an image of the thumbnail which doesn't really make much sense because I recall seeing a ton of other videos that use the image of the thumbnail and they weren't age restricted so I, I got really paranoid around this time. I got paranoid that YouTube was sort of suppressing me. And of course now, obviously, in the light of my recent success with this video, that's clearly no longer the case. But still though, for a period of about three months, it just seemed like all the numbers on my channel were lower than they should have been. And that made me very concerned, and it made me very suspicious of YouTube. And when I first saw the Tower Dog leaks, I was a little bit skeptical. It just seemed awfully bizarre that YouTube would go after specific channels. At the time, it didn't really occur to me that they would even care about specific channels. But after that stretch of three months or so, where I felt like my account was targeted and suppressed by YouTube, I started looking into things a lot more. And that was about the time when I sort of renewed my interest in making the Leafy video. Because it began to dawn on me that what if the same thing that allegedly happened to me also happened to Leafy, but a hundred times worse. So after the Jimmy Kimmel video, I started researching and writing the Leafy Was Here script. And during my research, I began to unpack all these signs that supported the theory that YouTube suppressed Leafy's channel. And the more research I did, and the more evidence I found at this theory that YouTube suppressed Leafy's channel, the more I became sure that this was what happened to Leafy. And as I did more research, and as I dug deeper, I began to realize with confidence that Leafy got screwed. The dude got absolutely screwed over, and nobody really realizes it except for me. And you can go on YouTube right now and look at all the other What Happened to Leafy's Here videos. They're all kind of the same. They all cover the same sort of scope of events. But what I began to realize is that the story of Leafy goes so much deeper than kind of what's public knowledge and what's generally presented by the commentary community. Leafy's disappearance just goes so much deeper than what everyone thinks. So with this new burden of knowledge, I felt like it was sort of my responsibility to present the whole story and to present what I'm fairly certain is the truth of what actually happened to Leafy. So that's kind of why the video is 51 minutes long. It's because with the issue of Leafy is here, there's simply so much information to unpack and I felt like I really needed to present that information adequately. There's simply too much of a story to tell to make the video any shorter. And thankfully, people really appreciated that effort. Of course, there were a few people commenting like, Oh, 51 minutes, I'm not watching that. But I actually kind of turned it around on a lot of people. I saw some people commenting, Oh, 51 minutes, that's too long. And then 51 minutes later, they leave a second comment saying, Wow, that was actually pretty good. So for those of you guys who are patient, just like to stick around, watch the whole thing, I really appreciate it. And since this video got so much traction and created so much of a discussion, I felt like I was sort of obligated to follow up on it and respond to some unanswered questions that people might have had. So I took to Twitter and I asked my followers to post any questions they had about the Leafy video. And I got a ton of responses. I tried to narrow down what I'm covering to sort of a few general questions that a bunch of people were asking. So let's get into that. 
This person wonders what other types of YouTubers I think that the YouTube algorithm has tried to shut down. And this is a very interesting notion that I'm sure a lot of people inferred after I presented my theory about how YouTube censored Leafy's channel. If YouTube would go so far as to completely suppress Leafy's videos, what other type of censorship could they be doing? From what I've seen on YouTube, definitely a lot of political channels, they don't get very many views. Recently, gun channels, that was something that was actually reported on in the news, where YouTube is kind of suppressing gun content now in the wake of the recent school shooting spree in America. When answering this question, it's kind of hard to tell for sure, but there's certainly patterns that you can observe. Basically, anything YouTube lists in its demonetization guidelines, any channel related to those guidelines have typically been shown to perform less well. I believe the YouTube censorship machine extends far and wide, but it covers a different extent depending on what kind of video it is. It's very interesting what you can observe out there if you keep your eyes open. Lots of people ask for my thoughts on what Leafy could have done to sort of redeem himself in the eyes of the general public. Well, personally, I think Leafy's downfall boils down to two very critical moments. The first one was the Tommy NC rant and subsequent backlash. I think that was the first real moment where a substantial number of people turned against Leafy. Before that, it was basically just smooth sailing for him, but that was sort of the first crack in his empire. I think if after the Tommy NC video, Leafy had just sort of stopped roasting individual people, he might very well still be around today. A lot of people commented on my Leafy video saying that they used to be subscribed to Leafy and they enjoyed his rants and his story time videos, but they kind of lost interest once he just started becoming primarily a roast channel. And honestly, I think if he had just gone back to that style of giving personal stories, personal anecdotes, he would have been fine. And he would still be quite popular today. But anyway, after the Tommy NC video, I think him deciding not to change up his style and just to continue with roasting random people on the internet, I think that was the point of no return for him. Because after that point, YouTube got involved. And once YouTube kind of sort of put the clamp on his channel, he could not really recover. Now, uh, the second critical point for Leafy was the uh, content cop response. So if the Tommy NC incident is sort of what caused Leafy's numbers to go down across the board, the content cop response is what caused him to sort of lose the respect of the majority of the commentary community. I think had Leafy just sort of owned up to the criticism instead of just responding to it negatively, like he just sort of did with any old YouTuber. I think if he had shown some humility, some empathy in that situation, I think it's fair to say that he wouldn't have been hated nearly to the extent that he was. But unfortunately for him, he kind of handled the response to Content Cop poorly, and as a result he got hated. And an unfortunate side effect of that was that once Leafy's videos started disappearing from everyone's recommended, uh, no one really cared, and no one sought to investigate that further, just because of the extent that he was hated. Several people asked me about the research process of my videos. Well, the first thing I do when I get an idea, I often casually research the topic months in advance, months before even starting a script. It's not as difficult as it probably sounds. It's usually just something I'm curious about, and I gradually look deeper and deeper into it, slowly gathering facts. And what I do is, instead of just presenting a bunch of random facts about an incident or a topic, I really strive to piece together sort of a narrative of what happened. And then I try to find evidence and screenshots and videos that support that narrative. For the research process, I spend a ton of time on the Wayback Machine, the web archive, that's how I got most of the footage and screenshots on the Leafy video. The Web Archive is just a tremendous resource for finding information about stuff that happened in the past. You'd be surprised the amount of information you can find on that website. And it's very helpful because over time on the internet, a lot of information and truth sort of just gets buried very quickly. 
Like, for example, going into this video, I had no idea Leafy even made Minecraft videos, yet that was a core part of his channel for three years, and it's actually somewhat insightful for explaining why Leafy did some of the things he did. It was because he learned a lot of these traits during the Minecraft era. But until my video, no one really talked about that. It was something I had to learn myself going through all the old past screenshots of his channel. Lots of people asked me about what my thoughts were on Grade A Under A. I referenced Grade A in the video, but there was never really a point where I discussed anything about him. For those of you who don't know, Grade A Under A was another commentary channel that got popular around the same time as Leafy, and they were actually friends behind the scenes. And kind of like Leafy, Grade A had this very endearing style where he would just sort of openly rant about a bunch of topics and his production quality was really poor but people didn't care just because the way he spoke was so charismatic and captivating people just kind of wanted to get behind him so what happened to grade was that after 2016 he kind of just stopped making videos about a year before leafy stopped actually and kind of just like leafy you don't really hear about anything from him anymore I did have a look at his analytics, and interestingly, they show a similar pattern to Leafy's analytics where they suddenly fall off and they just never recover. And the reason that's so interesting is because Grade A was also one of the channels listed in the Tower Dog leak in the YouTube memo. It was one of the named channels that YouTube sort of wanted gone from the platform. And so I find it very interesting how he sort of disappeared as well. You could kind of attribute a lot of that to him just not making videos for almost two years now. But still though, it's it's something to consider how he was also one of the targeted channels in YouTube's alleged suppression effort and how he, just like Leafy, is not around anymore. I probably won't do a YouTube Geographic on Grey Day, kind of just because much of the content of that hypothetical video would pretty much already have been covered in the leafy video but it's still an interesting topic nonetheless and i suggest other people look into that phoenix haggard asks if the project was fun well i don't know if fun is the right word but i did enjoy making the project i really enjoyed the aspects of sort of piecing together a story that no one really knows yet and just having the dramatic irony knowing that once i upload this video it's kind of going to change the way people think about this certain issue. So that was very important in motivating me to finish this. The whole effort of the video from writing to editing probably took me over 40 days of work. And the video did end up running very long. There are certain points during editing where it does get very tedious and you kind of just want it to be over. But like I said, the idea of sort of changing people's minds about an issue is highly motivating and it made me very excited to finish this video and put it up online for everyone to see. A few people wanted to know if I think Leafy will ever come back to YouTube and personally I think he'll be back. Partially for reasons that I'll get into later but mostly because YouTube is just such a magnet of attention right now it's pretty difficult to go anywhere on the internet and escape YouTube's pull. I'm pretty sure that Leafy, wherever he is, still uses the internet. He most likely does not live like an Amish person. And I think it's fair to say that he probably anonymously watches YouTube every now and then. I honestly just think he got burnt out from all the hate and he's taking a break. And I'm fairly confident that one day he will return. This person asks me sort of what I've learned from the whole experience of researching and producing this video and if Leafy had learned anything. Well first of all for me, um, I definitely fear YouTube a lot more now because I'm fairly certain that they blackball Leafy out of existence on the platform and if they can do that they can do the same to me or you. So I had always suspected that YouTube was corrupt to an extent, but researching this video really put that whole notion in a whole new light where this is an actual tangible event that YouTube has done to a person. Also while making this video, I learned that sort of the YouTube 
process, the YouTube game, it can really have some negative effects on people. A lot of people think that being a YouTuber is just the easiest thing in the world and you just upload gaming videos and you basically print money. But this whole leafy thing made me realize a very dark side of YouTube where the whole YouTube process, all the fame, all the fans, it can really mess with someone's psychology and mental health. And Leafy is a tragic case of that. And this was one of the themes I tried to portray in the video with the whole shining motif. YouTube began to control Leafy, not the other way around. Leafy just became so obsessed with getting views and subscribers that he sort of lost sight of a lot of stuff that made him human. And that's very dark to say, but if you look at the whole story of Leafy, he started out as just a kid playing Minecraft and having fun with friends. And slowly but surely, YouTube fame kind of poisoned him and poisoned his mind and, and turned him into sort of this mini tyrannical dictator. And it's very sad how YouTube and fame can do that to otherwise decent people. Now, do I think Leafy learned something? Probably. I think the fact that he quit at all and just stopped making videos may be a sign that he finally realized his wrongdoings. He finally realized the extent to which he was hated and the damage that he had done. And if Leafy returns, he might see a completely changed man and hopefully he will have learned from his mistakes. So here's the big popular YouTuber collusion bonus round. Uh, Mumkey Jones asks, when will you make a Mumkey documentary? Well, Mumkey, if you're talking about the crossover video we did, the answer to that is a few days ago. So if you guys want to watch me narrate a Mumkey Jones documentary, check out the video on Mumkey's channel. Link in the description. If you're asking about the Mumkey Jones YouTube Geographic, I'm afraid I can't do one on you yet because you haven't gone on the downward spiral. You see, YouTube empires are interesting, but YouTube empires that go on a downward spiral, that's YouTube geographic worthy. I don't know, Mumkey, all I see when I look at your channel is, uh, your numbers are going up, you're, you're raking in the fans, you're just too successful right now. And I'm afraid I can't produce a leafy style documentary on you yet. Internet Historian asks, what was the file size of the video? And the answer to that is, 4.56 gigabytes. Yeah, the uh, 51 minute 1080p videos will do that to you. Turkey Tom brings up an interesting hypothetical. If I would rather have a situation where Leafy never lost popularity. And uh, it's kind of a difficult question to answer because it's really hard to tell what would have happened if Leafy had never fallen off his throne on the commentary community. I definitely think that if Leafy had not lost popularity, he would probably be somewhere around the 8 to 10 million subscriber range by now. And it would be very interesting to see him go toe to toe with channels like Logan Paul and Rice Gum. But at the same time, what kind of effect would that have on, on sort of the toxicity of his community? If you took the height of Leafy's empire and doubled that, how much of a problem would that make for sort of the YouTube community as a whole? Would Leafy even be able to achieve those numbers continuing to roast people or was his decline kind of inevitable because YouTube viewed him as such a threat to the well-being of the website? You have to kind of consider all of those factors when considering the hypothetical of Leafy still being popular today. As for the current status quo in sort of the commentary sphere of YouTube, it's pretty stagnant as far as I can tell. Where Leafy died, he kind of gave rise to about half a dozen Leafy clones. I'm not gonna name any names, but you guys probably know who I'm talking about. All of them are kind of the same. Very little distinction between any of those channels. They all have around the same subscribers. They make videos on the same topics. And as a result, they kind of took Leafy's old audience and split them several ways. So none of them really stand out that much. And the relevancy of all these commentary channels have sort of been dwarfed by the kind of status quo, prototypical YouTube vlog channels. It's hard to say that any of them really have hardly as much clout as what Leafy once possessed in throwing his weight around on YouTube. 
So I guess in summary to answer this question, I would sort of lean towards preferring how things are now, just because I felt that Leafy's decline was kind of inevitable anyway. And the decline of Leafy kind of ushered in an entirely new era of YouTube. I think the idea of Leafy sticking around and staying popular would have only delayed the inevitable. This guy kind of wants to know my thoughts on YouTube's sort of abuse of power and how they can sort of wave a magic wand, pull some strings behind the scenes, and decide if a channel lives or dies. I certainly think it's concerning, to say the least. I remember a time when YouTube was pretty impartial with these kinds of things, but you keep hearing reports time and time again that they seem to really want to limit and kind of throttle content that doesn't really fit the prototypical YouTube mold. In the past few years, at least, there's been a very heavy emphasis on preserving family-friendly content, and pretty much anything that deals with mature subject matter gets kind of throttled and blocked. And I guess my biggest concern over how YouTube sort of operates their business model now is that the entire website of YouTube will get stuck with this reputation of being just a kiddie kid website where the only stuff on there is stuff for children. And you'll start to see a mass exodus of adult content consumers on YouTube. It's never really a good look and it's never really sustainable for anything to kind of become labeled as a kid's thing. Another consequence I want to point out is sort of how in systematically eliminating the more bizarre, the more obscure, the more edgy content creators on YouTube, YouTube is forming a situation where the vast, vast, vast majority of content is incredibly saturated and incredibly similar. I feel like in the last several years on YouTube, there's been a very big sort of de-emphasis on actually putting effort and substance into your content. It's all about just hitting that 10 minute threshold and putting enough little bells and whistles in your videos just to keep your viewers attention for long enough and just giving them something to play in a tab while they're doing something else rather than actually making interesting dynamic complex content that demands your viewers attention so yeah those are the main consequences that could seriously jeopardize the future of youtube based on how they're running the website today trent brings up a very interesting point where based on my theory if youtube thought leafy was such a big problem and set such a bad example for youtube why don't they go after the entire sphere of douche YouTubers whose ridiculous antics set really bad examples for the impressionable youth watching their videos? And that's a very good question. It's a question I ask myself a lot. If I could give any theory as to why this is the case, I would probably relate it back to the little motif in my Leafy video where I talk about the really rich, successful YouTuber with a Lamborghini in his mansion. You see, you have to ask yourself how YouTube as a business can continue to entice new people to produce content for them. And I think what they do is they promote rich, successful looking people from Hollywood to the top of the website. And so every new viewer who watches YouTube, most of the content they watch will be from a really wealthy, attractive vlogger type person who lives in a mansion and has an expensive exotic car and sleeps with a supermodel every night. And through enough repetition of this, new viewers will begin to associate YouTubers with an opulent, wealthy, celebrity lifestyle. And they'll use that image as motivation to produce content. You see, the way I look at YouTube is that you have to understand that everything they do has an official meaning and then it has an actual meaning. Like for example, watch time. YouTube has placed so much emphasis on watch time over the past five years. The official explanation for the incredible emphasis on watch time is, well, we want YouTubers to make higher quality content. And if people are watching the videos for longer, that must mean the content is higher quality. That's what they tell you. But in reality, we can clearly observe that that's not the case. Uh, on average, content on YouTube has become a lot more watered down, a lot more bland, a lot more boring, and much less likely to keep your attention than it was back when they had a 10 minute maximum on videos. You see, the truth of why YouTube mandates that you increase watch time is one, advertisers pay a higher rate for longer videos and that makes them more money. And two, the longer you make people watch YouTube videos, 
the less time they spend on a competitor site like Facebook or Amazon. So YouTube has sort of a double meaning for every action they do. And you can kind of apply that theory to taking down Leafy. Of course, they never admit to it, but it's pretty clear from what I've researched that they did it. And I'm sure if they ever came out and talked about it, the official explanation would be something along the lines of, oh, he uh, he violated the guidelines. He, uh, he incited cyberbullying. He harassed children. They come up with a long official laundry list like that. But realistically, if you want to put a tinfoil hat on your tinfoil hat, I think that they might have gotten rid of him because he didn't fit the YouTuber brand. He didn't look like one of those attractive blonde Hollywood vloggers. And he was actually quite outspoken about several issues rather than being really vapid and innocuous. And they kind of viewed his whole image and sort of his whole incitement of rebellion as really unstable for uh, the whole YouTube image. That's the best I can do to explain why YouTube systematically got rid of Leafy while they let really douchey vloggers who are really guilty of many of the same things that Leafy was guilty of. They let them just run completely roughshod and connect to however many young impressionable fans they want. So that's an interesting little game you can play whenever YouTube says they're doing something Try to find the ulterior motive that's different from the official explanation. This guy brings up an interesting dilemma where the act of roasting popular YouTubers actually feeds into the popularity even more. And I kind of agree with that sentiment. An example I bring up is uh, the Logan Paul KSI boxing match. Logan or Jake Paul, I forget whichever one's fighting him, but there's a boxing match that's happening. And um, if you seriously think that they're doing this genuinely to settle beef, then you're probably a child who watches one of them because it's very clear that this is just a massive marketing opportunity to stimulate interest for both parties. It's just sort of a corporate artificial feud that kind of preys on people's hunger for drama and exploits people for attention. It's part of the reason why I kind of miss 2016 because a lot of that beef in 2016 was actually legitimate and not staged. But to go back to the general question, yeah, by and large, most conflict and drama on YouTube literally only serves to help both channels that are involved. Like the worst case scenario in a situation like this is that you get a ton of haters, but they still watch your videos anyway, and they still give you revenue just because they want to see you respond to the drama. And it's not just YouTube. You see stuff like this show up all over the place in entertainment, where by and large, it's better to be hated than to be irrelevant. And this guy brings up another interesting point, where he talks about how in sort of a continuation of the demonetization system, YouTube sort of made PewDiePie out to be the scapegoat for the whole thing. And I think on YouTube's end, it, they definitely succeeded. If you ask most people online, they would tell you that demonetization began after the whole PewDiePie racism controversy. And that's what most of the news articles about it report, but it's not actually true. YouTube's demonetization began back in August 2016. Coincidentally, a few months after YouTube's alleged secret meeting where they wanted to get rid of certain creators. So yeah, demonetization actually began six months before most people think it did. And I definitely think there was some scapegoating on YouTube's end at PewDiePie's expense. Come to think of it, PewDiePie has kind of become the go-to scapegoat for YouTube controversy lately, and it's kind of a shame. I don't think he deserves most of the criticism he gets from the media. The notion that PewDiePie started the demonetization system is certainly a prevailing misconception in mainstream society, and it's a shame because if people really looked into the issue, they see it extends far further than just a small racism controversy. And the final sort of question I want to discuss in this video is lots of people ask me, where do I think Leafy is now? And to be perfectly honest, I have no idea where Leafy is now. And I'm pretty sure no one really does outside of his close circle of real life friends. I was not able to get in contact with Leafy. However, I was able to get in contact with YouTube's favorite clown, Colossal's Crazy. Colossal actually reached out to me after viewing my video, and for those of you who aren't aware, Colossal's Crazy was one of Leafy's few true friends in the commentary community from back in the day. 
He sent me some messages that offer a lot of insight regarding Leafy's mindset and attitude with regards to YouTube. And with his permission, I'm going to share some of those messages with you right now. I haven't spoken to him in over six months, but we used to speak every day. He's totally disappeared from the internet, can't even get a hold of him on Skype. He even forgot the password to the email that accesses Twitter. It's kind of sad because we used to get on really well and speak all the time. Don't blame him though. YouTube fucked him over and after that, all he was left with was a bunch of mindless sheep hating him and having videos made on him by many commentators who are guilty of everything he was doing. The commentary community is riddled with hypocrites honestly. He was definitely a bit of a sociopath. Not like full blown, but a bit. He was borderline obsessed with YouTube. It became a real ego thing for him. It was pretty much all he had. This dude was a multi-millionaire, but he spent less than someone on minimum wage would spend in a year. That's how deep he was into YouTube. Pretty much never left his room and ate cheap packet noodles. He actually hated making videos, had no passion for the creative process whatsoever. He didn't like his own fans or interacting with them. He hated all other YouTubers and, quite rightly, didn't trust them. After a while, he didn't even care about the money. It was literally just a number to him at that point, and he didn't even know what to spend it on. Just seeing millions of views and the subscriber gains, that's the kind of stuff he got off on. I personally never understood it, but I guess everyone has different drives and motivations. So when YouTube fucked him, he had literally no reason to continue. He knew that no matter what he did, he was fucked forever. Even if he changed up his content, he was fucked. Maybe if he was encouraged more to continue, he'd still be around, but of course the leafy hate train was in full steam. If he came back to YouTube today, he'd probably be a very different person. That said, he did some altogether pretty fucked up things in the time I knew him. Even as his friend, sometimes it was hard to feel sorry for him when things backfired. He never deserved what happened though. He's actually really intelligent, believe it or not. He just had no life experience. Not even because of his age, but because everything he understood came from the internet. When I first met him, he was still living with his mother. He didn't know how to deal with basic problems, and despite the fact that he'd always ask for advice, he'd rarely ever take it. I see a ton of commentators now saying, bring back Leafy, or I miss Leafy. Nine times out of ten, they are saying that because they finally realized that, actually, them and their mates are doing the same thing he was doing. In all my time on YouTube, I've never seen such an insane case of bandwagoning. Even with Keemstar, it wasn't as bad. And that was fucking bad. I have no respect for the majority of the viewers in this community. They are led by the nose wherever they go. For the majority of viewers in the drama slash commentary community, they don't actually have the first clue of what good content is. They physically need someone to tell them what is and what isn't good content, and who is and who isn't someone worth watching, based on that and who they are. I defended him a fair bit on the baited podcast, maybe six to seven episodes, I can't remember. 100% your typical commentator didn't want to defend Leafy at all, for the reasons you mentioned. For me, I never considered making a video or anything. I don't think I'd ever really make a video like that. I definitely got a lot of hate for even associating with Leafy. Nowhere near as much for associating with Keem, to be sure, but that's honestly never really put me off. Obviously Keem had his own beef with Leafy. Grade supported Leafy behind the scenes and Pyrocynical wasn't really that good friends with Leafy. Leafy was only friends with three people. Keemstar, Grade, and myself. Everyone either disliked him or were fairly neutral with him. So yeah, definitely the main reason people didn't defend him was because of the bandwagon. It was the unpopular opinion. There were some things he did that were completely indefensible of course, but much of the hate coming from other YouTubers was hypocritical to say the least. I definitely was Leafy's biggest defender way back when. Did I do enough as a friend? That's a good question I suppose, but I'd say yes otherwise I'd have done more. When it comes down to it, in my eyes Leafy was guilty and deserved criticism for the following. Low quality content, making videos on children, his videos on Keemstar, what he did to Nick Cash, a few other minor things maybe, but that's pretty much it. As far as the clickbait goes, who cares? 99% of YouTubers seem to be doing that. The video stretching? Again. So many of his peers seem to be doing that. The social ineptitude? Welcome to YouTube. What else was there really? Far and beyond his biggest fuck-ups from my perspective were everything he was doing to children. That was just completely indefensible. Everything paled in comparison to that, but it's often been far from his biggest criticism. When you measure what he's done to what others do today, the hate was never warranted. I see what others are doing, some of which are also friends of mine, and it's either the same thing or worse. People have this idea in their head that Leafy is this fucking evil bastard. 
That's just not the case, and these exact same people seem to have no problem with another YouTuber when he does the exact same thing. It's a mob mentality that's absolutely stereotypical with the average content consumer in this particular genre." Unquote. So it would seem that Colossal had a lot to say on Leafy's behalf. It's clear that he certainly resented the commentary community a lot for what they did to Leafy following the content cop. I find it very interesting that he sort of reaffirmed many of the theories I brought up in my Leafy video. Most importantly, according to Colossal, he and Leafy both had a strong belief that YouTube was deliberately suppressing Leafy's content. I also found it very interesting what Colossal said about the psychology behind Leafy. You know, in my video about Leafy, I included the motif of The Shining as sort of a metaphorical device. However, according to what Colossal said, it might have turned out to be not too far from reality, where apparently Leafy became legitimately obsessed with the idea of YouTube fame, and just like I said in my video, his subscriber count quite literally began to control him. So ultimately, although Colossal's testimony was very insightful, it doesn't really answer the question as to what Leafy is up to now. And originally, this was going to be the end of the video. Just a very unsatisfying, mostly unresolved ending. However, as I was editing this project, another member of the original Baited podcast, Tommy C, messaged me and came forward with his own information about Leafy. He actually informed me that Leafy contacted him very recently, after a period of not hearing from him for over six months. So based on that, I decided to ask Tommy a series of questions related to Leafy, and this is what he had to say. When was the last time that you had contact with Leafy? Well, up until the other day, um, I, had, uh, I hadn't had contact with Leafy since early 2018, and that conversation consisted of let Billy the Fridge and Clown know you're okay. It was kind of a shock to hear from him because I had been convinced that he was probably uh, gone for good at that point. You know, it, it, it's funny with me and Leafy, uh, or Leafy and I, I should say. I didn't know exactly how he felt about me, and when he had the um, some of his personal photos leaked, he switched a lot of his Skype around, and he made sure that, uh, you know, that, that the changes that he made, that I was aware of all of them so I could continue to contact him. So I'm pretty sure that, while we're not the closest of friends by any stretch, that we uh, generally enjoy our conversations. How would you describe your relationship with Leafy? Would you consider yourself friends? Well, to put it, if, if Leafy asked me to help him out with something, I certainly would do it. Uh, again, we're, we're not the closest of friends. I, I, I would consider us internet friends. We've had uh, several well over an hour conversations. I find him to be um, fascinating on his take of the world. He's exceptionally bright, very quick, and, and hungry for knowledge. And I don't say that to, uh, to, to, to sort of pump sunshine up his ass. Um, that's generally who he is. He, he generally enjoys in engaging conversations. But to sum it up, yeah, I think me and Leafy are internet friends. I, I don't know if it goes much farther than that. I, I would imagine uh, him and Grade and Billy and, and uh, Colossal's crazy. I, I think they would consider themselves friends. I'm more of a guy that he likes to chat with uh, once in a while, to be fair. Summarize what Leafy told you with regard to his decline. I can't say we had too many conversations about this because it would have been an uncomfortable topic. I, it's not something I would have brought up. I mean, I know what it's like to decline. I know what it's like to be minuses on Social Blade. It's not something we would talk about. We'd probably more talk about esports or um, we got in a big conversation about Quake one time, which we're both fans of. But he did seem to suggest something that uh, you uh, put in your video that he was somewhat suspicious about YouTube hiding his channel or doing something to his channel to make it less available based on some of the statistics that he saw. Uh, but he was honest with the fact that he wasn't quite sure how they were doing it. And then amusingly, he said, although I do think he was being very literal, amusingly, he said that if I were them, I would block me or I would hide. I'd get rid of, actually, what he actually said was, if I were them, I would I would get rid of me too, which I, I thought was really amusing. But I think he meant it quite, uh, quite literally from a business perspective. In other words, if he owned YouTube, he would not have somebody like him on the platform. After personally speaking with Leafy, what are your impressions and overall attitude, mental state? Was there more to him than what showed on YouTube? Absolutely. Well, I could say without a shadow of a doubt 
Uh, I know a lot of people are worried about Leafy, and and obviously it would be the way he just kind of ghosted. He ghosted a lot of his friends and really didn't let them know what was going on. But I can say without any reservation whatsoever that Leafy is more than mentally healthy, uh, happy. He is um, irritated about what YouTube has become, but he kind of uh, hinted that uh, there's been other endeavors outside of YouTube. Uh, he told me, I mean, he said I could be 100% honest, that he was quite wealthy prior to his, his his explosion on YouTube. I don't think that his mental state is anything uh, to be concerned about. Um, I think like, Leafy's quite happy uh, with his girlfriend and uh, quite happy with, with his life. His attitude overall, uh, again, he, he's, he's upset about the changes in YouTube, like most of us are. Uh, but I think it, it sickens him more than it does uh, me. He was there in the golden age, and he expressed frustrations like, I don't even know how you do it anymore because... In fact, he expressed embarrassment about the criticisms that he made of YouTube in 2015 and 16. And looking at YouTube now, and it almost seems like they were ridiculous criticisms because it, it, it's it's so much more difficult to make a living. And he does, he is really aware that there would be no Leafy in 2018. Or 17, for that matter. He's irritated about the state of YouTube. It's not what it was. He had problems with YouTube back in the day, but he's um, kind of looked back at that and seemed like, wow, it was, it was a much better place back then. And I, I think uh, I think we can all agree on that. Do I personally agree with the theory that YouTube intentionally sabotaged a Leafy's channel? Look, when, when it was first suggested to me, and I, and I actually can remember the date, it was an early... It was about February of 2017 when it was first suggested to me. But it, like, I, like I said before, it was kind of in a casual way. But I do think Leafy was being literal about it. After watching your video, I'm getting there. But I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, but I'm getting there. And I, and I do believe Leafy believes that. But would I be shocked if your video and uh, Leafy's theory was 100% on? No, not at all. Especially um, with what I've seen with my own videos and uh, own podcasts. Um, and now that everything's being, I, I don't, I don't even think there's an algorithm anymore. I think there's just automatic demonetization. I'm getting there. This, this, there's certainly something to it. How did I react to the leafy content cop? Did you ever consider defending him? Uh, no, not at all. Although I, I've, I've changed dramatically in my views of YouTube and the way I conduct myself. When I was invited on the baited podcast from Keem, uh, Keem was my guy. I was going to get this horrible person that I never met. I'm going to get him back. I'm going to get him off the platform. I'm going to embarrass him. I'm going to fuck him up with my own podcast. Some of my biggest podcasts uh, had Leafy in the title where I was heavily critical of him. When the content cop came out, I laughed ridiculously. I still think it's the best one as far as entertainment perspective. That's just my personal opinion. But I was a very uh, different YouTuber, for lack of a better word, back then. And I was consumed in environment of revenge it, revenge that wasn't even mine to take but i viewed a keemstar as a victim and in some ways he was and uh some somebody that gave me a little glimpse of, of internet fame and i was going to do absolutely everything in my power to damage leafy i don't feel that way anymore I've, I've since learned that you have to produce content other than revenge content or drama content you know people leave you if that's all you have to offer the world, then it's just like you're just an angry dude. And I think I've succeeded in that and then I've turned things around a lot. But it, it was sort of a hard lesson to learn. And I remember I was just like, I, I was talking to Leafy and he was talking about somebody who had made a criticism of him. I usually call this the teenage girl defense. You don't even know me. He, it does irritate him. And he's right about this, that you can sort of psychoanalyze somebody on, the, on YouTube, never in front of them, never talk to them and never really do any other research than what's already available on the internet and come with these sort of scathing character summaries, sort of analyze a person in a way where you sort of are projecting that you know who they are. And, and I think that's right. I, I, it, meeting Leafy for the first time, it, it was a strange thing because I was so bred to hate his guts. And he first approached me prior to uh, the Baited Podcast breaking up. I was very charmed by him. I found him interesting, intelligent, and not to mention the fact that he was one of the more powerful uh, YouTubers at that time. It was sort of just after the Nick Cash thing, and it wasn't quite as sure that this was his downfall at this point. You know, this is the guy that was in some days out averaging Pootie Pie on subs. Yeah, it was it was it was overwhelming, and and even after he started to dip, I I still saw him as a as a fascinating character and a fascinating personality. I still do. He is extremely charming extremely intelligent and extremely interesting 
going back to what you said before that I don't think I properly a answered, um, is he different than what he shows on YouTube? Absolutely. I, I think he's a person with a hell of a lot of depth, despite the fact that he never went to college and uh, grew up rather poor. Do you think that Leafy deserved all the hate and punishment he received? No, looking back, but I wouldn't have said that back then. I do believe, and by the way, Leafy agrees with this, well, that he put himself in a position to receive this kind of hate. We both agree on that. The videos that he made on kids, I, I, I could never, ever, ever support them in any manner. I still find them disgusting to this day that he would pick random children and just kind of like goof on them. I mean, of course, we all make cringy videos when we were kids. Now there's this whole social media outlet. You know, you just don't do it on your camcorder anymore like you did when I was a kid. It's for the whole world to see. But that being said, it was just so funny after the content cop and then I, I don't even think the content cop was as damaging as the uh, Nick Cash reveal. I think that was the final nail in the coffin, not the content cop. The content cop gave permission for everybody to sort of come out and, and say how Leafy had treated in the past. And then if you also remember, after Nick Cash came out, there was a whole slew of other stuff. Once the seal was broken or the floodgates were open, the flood came in. Um, no, I don't even think all the criticisms were, were right on. And, and the thing is, like, you liked Leafy so much. You were willing to work with Leafy. You were willing to do this, all this stuff and, and willing to look the other way when he did make questionable things. And now all of a sudden he's the worst guy in the world. And Keemstar is a good guy. No, I, I think uh, it's like most um, situations on YouTube. Everybody snaked each other. And I don't know if anybody's any worse than any, any character. And you could throw me in this pile as well. I, I've had to kind of soul search a bit for my role in this. I think we were all a bunch of rats and snakes, thinking of ourselves, thinking about doing each other, only thinking of fame and and and, and we're more internet fame and 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 boosting our profiles. And uh, I'm for one. I'm glad that I kind of got out of that way of thinking for my own sanity. But no, I, I think uh, nobody deserves all the hate they get. Leafy's a human being. He deserved what he got. But there's always you can always point to a few examples where it's just way over the top. What do you think that Leafy is doing now? Do you think he will return to YouTube? And if so, do you think he will ever overcome the hate? Uh, what do you think Leafy is doing now? Well, he did give me permission to speak frankly. I tell you that he's working, not in, not in, a, not in a fast food joint. He, he, he's still he, very much the entrepreneur that I met in 2016. Will he return to YouTube? Well, I can tell you that he has floated the idea of making content again. And in more of a sense that he try it, but he is very irritated by the state of YouTube. It's just simply not fun for him anymore. You got to understand with Leafy, and I, I think that's why he put himself in a bad situation. He He's a gamer, hardcore gamer. Can you say that anymore? Does that make me sound old? <laughs> uh, no, he loves gaming, loves esports. He really is passionate about esports. So that passion that he had for YouTube, which is probably the same for eSports e as far as producing content, but I don't think it's the same passion that me and you have, uh, making the perfect video. I mean, if you ever played Pac-Man, the, the only worry to determine the better player is who has the most points, and for him, hits were the most points. And I don't think that he finds that very interesting anymore, not because, I don't necessarily think because it's great. Uh, and a lot of, I think a lot of his closest friends would disagree with me on this. I think it's because he enjoys the game so much. I mean, he certainly he doesn't need any more money. We're talking about a 20-year-old millionaire, and now he's 22. And I don't think much of it. I'm sure it's all in good places. Levy's not the type of guy to go out and just blow all his money or do something extremely insane. And from what I understand, he lives, I wouldn't even say relatively humble, small. That's the way he is. He said that he thought about it, but he's just simply not passionate. You may see one more video about Leafy. It, it wouldn't shock me as if he acted like he was never away. Like, hey guys, sorry I've been away for a while, but check out this kid right here. I could totally see that happening, you know? I totally could. But he's not passionate about it because it's not the same. If I can make a gaming comparison, um, Quake 3 was um, a, a staple of esports in its day, and then Quake 4 came out and nobody liked it, and it wasn't really a staple of esports. I think that's the difference between 2016 and 2017. And that's the way, it's just not fun. He's well off. I don't think it's about money. That's, that's just the bonus. I think it's about the high score. And I think the way he sees it, he was champ. He won this game. And uh, yeah, he could get back in it, but it would never be, the, it's, it's not the same game that he was playing before. So he's not that interesting. I remember said, saying to that, you know, Nerd City thinks that daily content is actually um, being rejected by the al algorithm. So he said something he said something to me the effect of but like i could never do the daily grind again and i said that's great because the daily grind actually might hurt you in the algorithm i told, told him what nerd city had told me and uh he's like really and i started to realize that he's really been out of it as far as uh 
being engaged in YouTube like, you know, content creators like you and me are. That seems so foreign to him that you didn't have to do the daily grind. And it turned him off. And, and he even said that he made, it made him angry because that's what I think he liked doing. He liked hustling and he liked getting the high score. And now the rules have changed as such where it doesn't favor his strategy. And I don't think that's an insult. I think that's a fact. I think actually he would agree with me. And how can I say it's all not about money? No, I think it's the number. Some of us get off by getting the high score, whether we get rewarded by money or not. Everybody likes money, but I, I do think that it's um, an extremely competitive nature. Leaf is the type of guy to play Monopoly and make sure he, he has everything locked up, every house, and wins every deal. And I think that's the key to his success. Do I ever think he will overcome the hate? I think everybody has a chance to overcome hate. It just depends on how you pr present yourself. Do I know how or what the key to that is? My suggestion to him was a while ago. I don't know if he heard me a lot. It was over a year ago. Come out as Calvin, not Leafy is here. I think Calvin's like way more interesting than Leafy. His insight on the world. I mean, he mentioned um, to me about writing a book about young people, very young people, receiving large sums of money for their work and how it affects them. That would be interesting to me. That would make excellent videos. I don't know if his fan base is ready for that, but it might bring on a new one. You know, we saw Poods kind of grow from a a child entertainer to something more interesting. I, I think Leafy's capable of that himself. I don't know if he knows it. Skype Leafy, depending on the presentation, I don't know exactly how he should do it, would be, for me, a lot more interesting. Will it ever garner the hits that he once had? It would, would it ever garner the growth that he once had? Probably not. But it would definitely, I think it would definitely bring him a different audience. And he definitely could be relevant again. And by that, yeah, then he could overcome the hate because he has a completely new crowd and enough times went by. Has Leafy uh, changed since he left YouTube? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. He seems like the same guy to me. He's a complicated dude. I don't fully understand him. He's very private. Whenever we've gotten into uh, personal conversations, he, he, he kind of skirts them. He talks about gaming. He talks about YouTube. He talks about business. Uh, Leafy talks about, you know, what he's interested in. He's passionate about it. Really passionate about it. I, I just remember, I keep on bringing up Quake. I mean, I remember when he says, you played Quake back in the day? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I, I did. It, that area of like like 1995 to 1999 it was like a, a golden esports age to him, you know, that he wasn't around for because he was younger. I don't know if he was that bad to begin with. Would his content change? Maybe. Probably not. I don't know. We're only talking about two years of time here. You know, he's 20 and now he's 22. So no, I don't think he's changed much at all. Does he regret his YouTube career? Absolutely not. I think he feels he won. He was world champ. He was defeated. He won the game and then he lost the game. He was Mike Tyson for a while. And then he lost. No big deal. He's a gamer. Pick up a new game. And I think that's what he did. No, I don't think he has any regrets whatsoever. I don't think Leafy has too many regrets in life. There's a lot of unseemly things about him. And there's a lot of unseemly things that he's done on YouTube. And I've mentioned them in the past. But I, I think that really it boils down to, to the gamer that he is. The people that are on my new team and help my channel and work for me, I see them as friends, even though I might not have stood in front of all of them at some time. I, and I think uh, Colossus Crazy feels this way as well. Um, you're not friends until you, you shake hands, go out, have a couple beers, and, and know each other. So I think sometimes, although this is not excusing his behavior, I think he sees Nick Cash, Elvis the Alien, and, and it does sound cold. Uh, me, uh, 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 Keemstar, Great A under A, or maybe not Great, 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 great he's close with, um, as, you know, they're gamers, and, and he's there to beat them. And I think that sometimes he doesn't recognize that there's people behind that avatar. And... If I could defend him on that, I, I think that has a lot to do with his age. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that he never had kids. I think it has a lot to do with that Leafy had a difficult upbringing. That was the um, one of the biggest embarrassments that I had when I was attacking him. I actually, and, and, and considering recent events, this is kind of funny. I, I attacked him with information that I got from Michael McCrudden, which is all wrong, of course. And I remember I said something to them. I, I mentioned this embarrassing moment, this attack that I used, and I asked him if it was true. And he says, where did you hear that from? And it didn't really make me realize that he's a human being. And it also made me realize that I was getting way too caught up in this shit. You know how people say they don't give a fuck? And you know when they're repeating it over and over again that they do? Leafy really doesn't give a fuck. I mean, how, much, how all the horrible things that I said about him and his family and... You know, the, the horrible things that I was willing to do to lower myself, to get even with him, to help my hero, Keemstar. It's embarrassing. Leafy's just a guy. He's just like you and me. He's flawed. He's a little cold, but he's fascinating and he's successful and he'll always be a YouTube legend. And uh, that's Leafy is here. And I hope he does come back. I'd be interested to see what he would do. Well, everyone, that's probably the best testimony we're going to get 
from someone who was close to Leafy and has spoken to Leafy very recently. So once again, a big shout out to Tommy C. You can check out his channel below, link in the description. And that's about it for now. I hope that this video has given some of you guys some closure about Leafy is Here. Some of you might say that I'm milking the subject, but that's never really been my intention. For me, the truth is that this is just a very interesting topic. My goal for making this video, as well as the original Leafy video, is to tackle some of these unanswered questions. It boils down to the simple fact that Leafy had a huge following, and he just disappeared. And I feel like people have a right to know at least some of what happened. So for those of you who are still watching at this point, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you in the next one.